Those of us who live in Asia have lived for centuries with the reality of cultural and religious diversity. Diversity is part of life in Asia. Respectful and sensitive to others, we live by and large in harmony. Inoffensive and firm, we live out our respective faiths as the truth. Yes, we have lived it with plurality, but not pluralism. Whether we are Buddhist, Muslim, or Confucianists, we have a firm conviction that what we believe and live by is truth, leading to authentic humanity or eternal life. Other paths would lead to perversion and suffering. But all this has changed now. Under the impact of globalization, while this pluralism is spreading like wildfire as rapidly as it is in the West, while this undermines traditional faiths and presents great opportunity for the gospel, it has nevertheless become a real threat to our proclamation of the gospel as the absolute truth. Pluralism is an ideology proclaiming that truth is a cultural construction, valid only to the culture that constructs it. It has no bearing on another culture or system of meaning. No truth can claim to be truth for all. All are relative. It pushes the point further from culture to individual. The individual is now presumed to be the ultimate ground of reality, the foundation on which meaning and values are created. Pluralists believe that each and every individual creates her own logic in constructing her own world. There can be therefore as many worlds as there are individuals, and each is merely a web of beliefs, true only to the individual who weaves it. As each is unique to itself, they are therefore incommensurable to one another. So despite all the rhetoric about dialogue, Pluralism has rendered all dialogues to be meaningless. At the same time, as truth is fabricated, it can be refabricated at will. It is therefore tentative and fluid, with no lasting bearing on anything. In condemning all truth to be radically relative and tentative, pluralism can in effect silence any proclamation of transcendent truth. In the name of condemning dogmatism, pluralism is in fact the most dogmatic of all ideologies, as it will frame any anti-pluralist concept of truth as being dogmatic and exclusivist. Pluralism is in fact a form of monism. It is monism of indifference. However, it is not difficult to see the self-contradiction in it. In proclaiming pluralism, the pluralist textually claims that he stands on a vantage point towering above all other claims, towering above everybody, so as to see their relativity. Yet, miraculously, the vantage point on which he stands is presumed to be absolute. How does he manage to do that? He manages to do that purely by faith. While trivializing truth and framing religious truth as oppressive, many pluralists nevertheless unashamedly promote the secular worldview to be true for all. Atheism is allowed to become the new religion and promoted as scientific, objective, and inclusive. It is now waging a war against religion in general and Christianity in particular, with unprecedented evangelistic zeal. The Atheist Bus Campaign in London is a good example. In June 2008, the campaign started with an advertisement on London buses saying, there is probably no God. Stop worrying. Enjoy your life. 
The campaign has now spread to Canada. In similar advertisement, two kids are posed, each pleading not to be labeled as Catholic kid or atheist kid, meaning they want to be brought up neutral. In a very subtle way, the campaign condemns parents for raising their kids with any conviction of truth. The monism of indifference is tightening its grip on our life. Yet at the same time, books proclaiming atheism just flood the market. With Richard Dawkins, the God delusion making the biggest impact. John Bakewell, a colonist for The Guardian, sounded forth the battle cry against religion in her praise of the book. And she said, Religions have the secular world running scared. This book is a clarion call to fear no longer. What is the battle all about? It is about taking back the right to define moral values for oneself over again any transcendent boundary. The real issue is how one's life is to be conducted. Such a secular ideology has consequences. The eclipse of transcendent truth has life implications. 21 years ago, a well-known Chinese intellectual wrote about the tragedy of the Chinese people in which he said, the tragedy of the Chinese people is a tragedy of a people without God. When the light from the transcendent other side is dim, the darkness of this side will come to be taken as infinite light. A society without a transcendent light would almost certainly absolutize itself and turn even its own darkness into light. It will sink into the darkness of its own corruption. Truth has consequences on the personal level as well. Dr. Ravi Zacharias once shared his experience of defending the objectivity of moral truth to a group of Oxford students. When he finished, a student challenged him, saying, Dr. Ravi, morality is purely emotive. Right or wrong expresses nothing more than personal preferences in an emotional way. Ravi responded and said, if that were true, let us put it to a test. Let me put a helpless baby on the table and chop him up into pieces. Would you not say what I have done is wrong? Calmly, the student retorted, no, I would not say that. I can only say I do not like it. Ravi was quite shocked. Alas, if I were there, I would have asked the student, if I were to put you on the table, ready to chop you up into pieces, would you not say that what I'm going to do is wrong and ought to be stopped immediately? And he, if he said, all I can say is I do not like it, then I would say I like it. I like it very much, and I happen to have the power to do it. You know full well the consequence. Without moral truth, might is right. Tribal war is inevitable. Without the divine decree that the human person is made in the image of God, affirmed by God to have absolute value and absolutely inviolable, why should anyone take all upon equal seriously? What is the ground for such a foundational belief of democracy? Do we believe this because emotionally we like it? Or simply we will to believe it out of rational calculation for self-interest or fear? What if Nietzsche is right that we invent such horror statement because we are weak, afraid that only the strong and mighty will survive and that we might happen to be the weak. The statement is horrible if it is all human invention. Why should I believe that I was born equal to you, as obviously I am genetically endowed to be smarter and stronger than you? We are not born equal, the smarter and the stronger would say. If moral values were cut from their transcendent source, then the highest virtue can only be a pragmatic function. The value of a person lies entirely in its function in a process. In the context of our reality, in the global market controlled by global corporations, the value of the human person lies in its marketability and functionality in the market. The person is thus a tool or commodity. Right before our eyes, we see the moral fabric of our social life being torn to pieces, with a human person being depersonalized into commodities or sets of functions. Let me borrow a line from Matthew Arnold. 
Our world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, have really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confusing ideologies, sinking deep into emptiness and alienation, consumed by unquenchable desires, with families broken, societies fragmented, and Mother Earth devastated. To turn back the tide, we have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ fierce, fearlessly, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the way. Only He can lead us away from the present state of fearness, uh, godlessness, actually the present mess, where the terror of man-made idols and selfish desire have us captivated and perverted, where meaninglessness and silent despair seep into our bones. Jesus Christ, the way, leads us back to God the Creator, the source of meaning and goodness. Jesus Christ is the truth because He is the foundation of all things. The Logos sustaining the universe is the person of Christ. In Him, the divine and the human come together in union, where the logic of the personal, of personal being is the logic of the nature of things. The truth reveals to us that the reality of the whole universe is created as the manifestation of God's love. Jesus Christ is the life, for He shows us life as it should be. Life in communion with God, infused with purpose, with a sense of wholeness. Life that knows the freedom to love and the freedom to live life to the full. Life open to the infinite richness of God. Today, if true were to appear in person to tell the world, or to, to particularly to tell the pluralists, I am the truth, the pluralists would ask, why should I believe you? Prove yourself. Truth cannot prove itself by anything other than itself. Jesus did not prove himself by appealing to anything other than himself. He proved in himself by the transformative power of his life. Likewise, we can only prove to the world that Jesus is the truth by his transformative power in our life. Our life transformed by Jesus Christ is something that the world cannot refute, not even the pluralists. Let us preach Jesus Christ with our life. Thank you.